Chapter 8 Julie tossed her keys on the desk and went immediately over to the bed. Her initial thought was to throw herself down and collapse in exhaustion. However, at the last possible moment, she remembered that she had slipped her laptop under the mattress on the side of the bed on which she had been sleeping. She froze in her steps, and while she had no desire to write or even think about what she had been writing, she didn't want to destroy her vehicle of exit either. She reached under, slid out the laptop, and carefully placed it under the pillow on the other side of the bed. Figuring she still had 20 minutes to pull herself together, she stretched out on the bed and turned on the television for a few minutes. The remote control was on the nightstand beside her. The set had been left on a local station, and they were airing a situation comedy, which she had no desire to listen to, much less watch. Her first instinct was to watch a news station. This had always been her instinct. This had been her life's work. She was inquisitive, curious, and information-seeking. She wasn't nosy or interfering. She wasn't a gossip. She was a news person. She switched to CNN. Garbage about the president, Fox, the same, MSNBC, more of the same. Funny how they all cover the same story but have totally different opinions about the same facts. Kills me. Facts are facts. And the people in this country think they're watching unbiased news when they're watching propaganda. She clicked back to a different local station. Shit. What the hell is going on? Who the fuck is doing this? Julie sat upright, her heart in her throat. She stared indignantly at the television. There, with microphones shoved in his face, flashes going off, and tears in his eyes, was Morty. He was making a plea to a kidnapper. Did somebody have one of the girls? Who was kidnapped? Julie forced her thumb down on the volume. I beg of you, please, do not harm my wife. We are willing to work with you in any way you want. I am not working with the police as you requested. He stepped back. Please draw your cameras back and show them there are no police officers here. Please pan around and show them I'm here alone. Please. Morty, you look terrible. I'm here. I'm safe. Please don't worry. I'm not being held by anyone. Please, Morty. Julie jumped up from the bed and ran to the closet. She grabbed the one shirt that was left hanging there and quickly changed. Her mind was racing. She had no idea how to handle this. If nothing else, she didn't want Morty to think anyone else was hurting her, but no solutions were coming to her mind. She only knew she had to stop this before it went any further. Julie grabbed her purse and her key without thinking and raced down the hall to the elevator bank. She heard the door of her room slam shut, but she didn't react. She didn't panic that she forgot something. She didn't pat her pocket or rifle through her purse to make sure she had everything. She just ran. Some motherfucker was trying to take advantage of my sweet Morty. Nasty opportunists. Don't care who they hurt to make a fucking buck. When the elevator doors opened at the lobby level, Julie glanced around to see if any of the girls were down yet, although she was remarkably sure they were not, having spent a full day with them. She knew they were not the kind to rush. She spotted someone sitting in one of the deep couches where she had sat just the night before. As she approached, she came up with a better idea. She spun on her heels and went directly into the hair salon. Her hairdresser would most likely be able to help her. Hi, remember me, she asked. Her hairstylist from the day before looked up from the head he had been working on and smiled. Oh, honey, how could I forget? Still feeling icky? No, you did wonders for me. But I was hoping you had a cell phone I could borrow. Mine's dead upstairs on the charger, and I have an emergency. Julie wasn't very good at lying on the spot. Somehow, it was coming easy to her. While she was feeling desperate, this time, it wasn't about her. No problem. Hold on a sec. The stylist finished wrapping a piece of foil and then reached into his back pocket and pulled out his phone. Just please delete the number when you're done. My husband is so jealous. He actually looks at my phone every night when I get home. Thanks. Julie snatched the phone from his hand. No worries. Is the locations app on? Are you kidding? He'd be following every move I make if I left that on. The stylist threw his head back and laughed hysterically. Great. I'll be right back. Julie was gone before he could respond. She walked purposefully to the front door of the hotel and out to the smoking area. There was no way she would be able to do this without having a cigarette in her one hand to steady her other hand and her insides. This message is for Dr. Morton Rosen. Tell him his wife is in no danger. She is not, I repeat, not being held by any kidnappers. 
some horrible opportunist taking advantage of his situation. Oh, and his good nature. Julie hung up the phone before the voice on the other end of the line could respond or even ask a question. That might not be enough. Who else can I call? The 911 operator may not even know who to notify of the message other than the police. Reaching into her purse, Julie pulled out her cigarette pack. There were only a few left, Julie noted, but she lit one anyway. I'll have to find a place to get more, I'm sure. She took a long drag and held it in while she tried to figure out who else to call. Val, this is Julie. Please, please don't ask me any questions, okay? Julie had dialed one of the women from the club. I'm fine. I'm not being held hostage by any kidnapper. You must call Morty and tell him that. I'm fine, but I'm not coming home for a while. I needed to get away. I was having a kind of a breakdown, I guess. Julie had to stop because there was a barrage of questions and yelling at the other end of the line. She held the phone away from her ear while she took another long drag from her cigarette. When there was a break in the screaming, she tried to talk. Val, Val, stop. Just please call Morty. Tell him you spoke to me. Tell him not to pay any ransom. Tell him I'm sorry I upset him so much. I'll explain later. She hung up. Julie stood next to the ashtray, smoking the cigarette down to the very end. I never dreamed some asshole would do this to Morty. I mean, I knew he would be upset that I was missing and devastated when he found out I had off myself, but kidnapping? Ransom? That's just atrocious, and geez, I never thought about Val and some of my other friends. It had been so long since I'd seen or even spoken to so many of those people, I thought they just didn't want to be around me. I felt like such a stick in the mud. She was crazy just now. Or am I the one who's acting crazy? Jules, what are you doing out there? We're ready to eat. Once again, Rachel's melodious voice jarred Julie from her thoughts. She looked up and saw her new friend standing next to the valet desk just inside the doorway. Come on, Linda's getting a table already. Julie dropped her unlit cigarette butt in the ashtray and slowly walked back to the hotel entrance. Coming, I had to make a quick phone call. As she breezed by Rachel, she added, I need to give back the phone. I borrowed it because mine's dead. You go ahead, I'll find you. Julie poked her head back in the door of the salon. Thank you so much. She reached out to hand the phone to the stylist. Oh, wait, I forgot to delete the number. She fiddled with the phone, deleting both calls, and then handed it to the stylist. I didn't ask your name. It's Tony Dollface, and you can use my phone anytime. As Julie walked through the lobby toward the restaurant, her heart started that familiar flutter. What if the 911 records show his number? What if they try to call Tony back looking for me? What if Val and the police put it together? What if Tony tells the police where I am? By the time she reached the table, she was in a full-blown panic. I'm ready for a drink. Julie plunked herself down in the only available chair at the table with her back to the door. This always made her uncomfortable. She hated not being able to see who was coming and going. It was an especially intense feeling at that moment because she was now on the lookout for getting caught. Wait, will this Tony guy remember that my hair was ratty brown and gray before he colored it? I mean, he sees how many women a day? People come and go from this hotel all the time. He probably meets a hundred a week. He won't remember. He's so flighty anyway. More worried about his jealous husband. I'll be okay. I'll tell him not to give me away after dinner. So, Rachel was waiting. Are you having the same as last night? We're doing the same deal as last night. Everybody buys one round. After that, everyone's on their own. Julie, once again snapped out of deep thought, agreed to the terms. That's fine with me. As an afterthought, Julie felt the need to justify her actions. Sorry if I seem a little distracted. I'm just really tired. Great. I'll go over to the bar and get things started. Meanwhile, somebody ought to fill Julie in on what's happening tonight. She may or may not want to stay. Rachel's voice trailed off as she headed toward the bar. I'm guessing the MC is going to be Linda. Julie directed her attention across the table to Linda, but it was Beth who began to explain. Well, she began, despite the fact that we know each other intimately and we've been through all of life's peaks and valleys together, still, one night a year, we have what some people would call a bull session. This intrigued Julie. How so? Maybe there won't be all the bickering and teasing. I mean, I've kind of figured out who these people are by how they interact, but I really know nothing about them. Guess that's the journalist in me. Everyone has a story, Beth continued. 
We talk about where we are in our stories and talk about families, friends, jobs, etc. It's kind of like one night of an annual New Year's letter, but without the picture. Julie smiled and glanced around at the other girls. She knew exactly what Beth meant. Over the years, she had gotten a lot of letters like that from college or high school friends, all with whom she has since lost touch. Sounds like a really interesting and fun evening. It will give me a great chance to learn all about you ladies. Do I participate or am I just an audience? Rachel had returned. We'll leave that up to you. See how it goes. The server is bringing the drinks. She slid into her chair and hung her purse on the back of her chair. I don't think the bartender trusted me to carry that many drinks. Personally, I don't blame him. Debbie crossed her arms. Julie deduced that Debbie was kidding as her forced frown gave way to a smile. I say that from experience. Debbie resumed the conversation. I still can't get the Mai Tai stains out of my white pants from the Honolulu trip, you klutz. Once again, the women were laughing as they did many times that day. Julie was feeling oddly calm. Her chest wasn't trembling. Her mouth wasn't dry. She tried to remember the last time she felt at ease, especially with strangers. Well, if I'm going to go out, I may as well go out on a good note, or maybe, maybe I need to do a little more research before I write the end of this story.